Welcome to today's broadcast of North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of NIC television students and your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist Tony Stewart. Today is a very special program for not only myself but our staff and uh, panel member uh, State Senator Mary Lou Reed. Our guest today is Father Bill Wasmuth, a Catholic priest and Father Bill in, in the Northwest is certainly known for uh, his active human rights role. He has been recognized not only throughout the Northwest but throughout the United States. Uh, Father Wasmuth recently uh, announced that he would be leaving uh, St. Pius Catholic Church in Coeur d'Alene and the city of Coeur d'Alene and so we have taken this opportunity on this program before he leaves our city uh, to bring him here today to pay tribute to this man and his work uh, not only here in Idaho but uh, throughout the Northwest and all the wonderful things he's done and Senator Mary Lou Reed is joining with me in this tribute. Before we get to uh, to our panel member and to uh, some of the questions, I would like to take this opportunity to say several things about our guest. Uh, first of all, as to his background, uh, which uh, some of this people have not heard before, and it's very appropriate that we do this uh, at this time. Uh, our guest was born in uh, Green Creek, Idaho, uh, and he uh, received education in this uh, state and also in Washington. He has a BA from St. Thomas Seminary in Kenmore, Washington, received in 1963. He also holds a Master's of Divinity from St. Thomas Seminary and received a Master's in Religious Education from Seattle University in 1976. In his religious work over all those years, he has served as Associate Pastor for St. Mary's Parish in Caldwell, Idaho. He was Pastor for Our Lady of the Lake Parish in McCall, Idaho, uh, and that was from 1969 to 70. He was Director of Vocations of the Diocese of Boise from 1969 to 1976. He was Associate Director of Education at the Diocese of Boise from 1970 to 72. He was Director of Education of the Diocese of Boise 1972 to 79. He became Pastor of St. Pius X Parish in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho in 1979 and has held that position to the present time. In addition to his total commitment to his parish and, and to all of his uh, members, he has been totally involved in whatever community he lived in and certainly that has been recognized. Uh, in those capacities, he has served as president of the National Conference of Diocesan Directors of Religious Education, and that was 77 to 79. He was in the state of Idaho uh, on the Citizens Prison Review Committee from 1979 to 80. He was one of the founding board members and was the first president of Hospice of North Idaho, Incorporated. He also served on the YMCA Board of Directors in this area from 1984 to 1987. He served on the Park and Recreation Commission for the City of Coeur d'Alene from 1985 to 87. He also has been a member of the Inland Northwest Communities Foundation Board of Directors from 1986 to the present time. He served on the Cataldo Mission Restoration Committee from 1986 and is still on that board. He served in two capacities in human rights that he's received uh, all the recognition that I have already indicated. He was the chairperson of the Kootenai County Task Force on Human Relations from 1985 until just about two months ago. And he was one of the founding board members and also the first president of the Northwest Coalition Against Malicious Harassment serving the states of Wyoming, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. For all these works and many that I have not listed, he's received a number of awards. Among those, he was chosen the Coeur d'Alene Chamber of Commerce Distinguished Citizen of the Year Award, uh, which he got in 1985. He also was the recipient of the Leo J. Ryan Award from the National Cult Awareness Network located <coughs> in Chicago, Illinois. And he was one of the co-recipients of the Raul Wallingberg Civic Award given in New York City to the city of Coeur d'Alene and for the work of the Task Force on Human Relations in Kootenai County in 1987. And his most recent uh, award came from the Idaho Statesman when they chose him on the first day of January 1988 as the Citizen of the Year in Idaho. Uh, Father Bill, I, uh, as I indicated, gone over just some of those things, but what is most impressing to me about uh, your life and your work, uh, you have done it because you believe in the human race and the dignity of the human race. And I want to say in my tribute to you that one of the great, great uh, parts of my life and one of the most enjoyable things that I will ever have to remember is these nine years of working so closely with you. And as you leave Coeur d'Alene, we'll continue to work together, but it's been a very uh, wonderful, wonderful experience to watch uh, your dignity and your commitment to others and 
we're just so privileged to be able to, to pay tribute in this way to you and, and to have this on tape to keep and to remember and for you to have it. At this time, I would like to turn to State Senator Mary Lou Reed and let her to make whatever comments that she wishes in tribute to our guest. Thank you, Tony. I'm not sure what I can add. You have really listed uh, a number of things. Uh, Father Bill, you have been very, very busy. I think it's important for those of us who are so fond of you to to uh, remind everyone that not only have you been busy in the in the cause of right and justice, you have been also a very warm and human person, and you've added a great deal of grace to our community. And we will miss you a great deal. And I think it's probably very difficult and very embarrassing to be a living legend. Uh, you are doing many, many superhuman things, but you are human above all else. And I think, uh, Tony, is a time that we, I think I feel very honored to be able to be with you today and with Tony because I think what we plan to do is to some degree reminisce about some of the accomplishments, some of the uh, comments that you want to make about what you feel has been done and what hasn't been done, those comments, I think, are what we want to uh, exchange. And if I may start, I would just like to uh, take you off this embarrassing point for a minute and um, just ask you, as you look back in your life, can, can you really tell where these crusading instincts came from? And here you are, you have done so much on behalf of the cause of human rights in our community and in our state and in our region. When did you far first realize that uh, that you really had things that you you wanted to do, that you wanted to change. Where did it all begin? I suspect that it began with my family as much as any. I, um, um, my father was just somebody, if things weren't right, he worked at making them better. And that's just the attitude that I grew up with. Um, I, I never considered that to be anything all that special or that unique, and I still don't. Uh, I just think as human beings, much less as Christian people, people of faith that, that if we see something that isn't the way it should be, that we work at making it better. Um, I admonish people in the parish and I try to live by it myself that, uh, that at the end of the day when we uh, lay ourselves down to sleep, um, it's not necessarily um, what great things we might have done that we should acknowledge during that day or what sinful things maybe we've done that we should lash ourselves for. I think the question we ought to ask ourselves is, is the world a little bit better place today because I was a part of it, or is it a little bit worse place because I was a part of it? If we can ask ourselves that question successfully day after day and year after year, then I think we're being the kind of human being that we're meant to be. I think we're being the kind of follower of the gospel that we're called to be. But that can be very contemplative, Bill, and you mm -hmm. certainly are a man of action. All right. Where do you think that this combination of, uh, of idea and um, is it anger? Is there some sense of justice? Where do you get the, the motivation that, that really forces you to get things done? Because oh, you have accomplished yeah, things. Yeah, I don't know if it's anger. Uh, I wouldn't put it there. I, I think it's, um, uh, I do feel driven somehow, and I probably am a compulsive person. And, um, and so I put my energy, uh, try to put my energy where my thoughts are and where my words are, where my mouth is. Um, that I think we need to be doers, not just sayers. The gospel says that, and I believe that. I used this past Sunday as a, as a part of the homily. I used that poster that has the rhinoceroses with their mouths wide open, and the saying says, when all is said and done, a lot more is said than done, and encouraged us all to turn that around. And, and when all is said and done, then a lot more is done than said. I think words are okay, but I think actions are much more important in terms of fixing things, making things better, making our world a little bit better. Um, and how where, 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 did that, where does yes. that compulsion come from? I don't know. It can get me in trouble, too, by the way. It, uh, sometimes that compulsion pushes me too far on things. And how does this apply to your work with the Task Force on Human Relations? How did this all come together? Your desire mm -hmm. to uh, make the world a better place and um, where you were the, the right person at the right time? That's exactly the point, I think. Somehow, you know, at the right time. Um, I fell into that as much as any. I didn't ask for all of that. To, you know, it just was. I was there, and and you take one step, and then the next step is there, and you take that step, and you take the next step as it comes along. Um, I didn't set out to be any great crusader of human rights. Uh, just uh, what I believe in. Um, the situations presented themselves, and I followed through with them, uh, with the support and the help of lots and lots of people. And, I got the limelight all the way through with this thing because I was the spokesperson uh, for the task force, especially during the trying times of 85 and 86. Um, but the whole task force and large numbers of people in the community were, were doing the same thing that I was doing. They just weren't in front of the cameras all the time with it. They weren't getting the, the public exposure with it that I was. 
Um, but their commitment to it and their uh, energy be uh, and the energy that they gave to it was just as solid as mine was and um, and much more impacting as a matter of fact than, than mine was because they're, they're the ones that were doing the work all along. Tony, so. I'm just going to keep talking to him until you interrupt. So uh. <laughs> well, well, I'll do that at this time and then we'll, <laughs> right. we'll get back. Your questions are just excellent, uh, Senator Reed, but <clears throat> I would like to, to delve into some of the issues of the human rights issue itself and that's a very all-encompassing term and uh, if you don't mind, uh, Bill, would you take us uh, a little bit through a definition in our society where all we have all the problems as we do, historically speaking, mm -hmm. with prejudice and bigotry. I'd like to start out by, by asking you, is there any difference between uh, prejudice and bigotry and discrimination? And in doing that, what do we mean when we say we are workers for human rights through these different organizations? I can only say what I am, I think, uh, because I think everybody's going to define that a little bit differently. I, I think the bottom line between, behind all of those terms is, is that we don't treat people with the justice and the respect that they deserve as being human beings. And in some cases that's going to be discrimination, where you, um, uh, in, in the case of discrimination, where, where you treat one person or a class of people different um, because of their skin color or their religion or their, or their culture or something. Uh, or it could be out and out racism, which is uh, putting a whole class of people, a whole race of people as being inferior. Uh, so, but the bottom line is treating people with, with uh, something less than the dignity and the respect that they deserve as human beings. Uh, the motivation for, for um, pursuing human rights can come from a number of different sources. You know? It can be simply because we're a member of the human race and that we recognize that all other members of the human race uh, have just as much right to be here as we do by the fact that they're human beings and recognizing too that as a member of the human race uh, as our world increases in population and shrinks in size because of media and all of that and transportation um, recognizing that if we are to survive on this world as people of, of the of, as all sharers of this common home that we have to build bridges and we have to see, treat people with respect and with dignity if we build and promote division and separation and put each other down we're going to blow this thing up I and mean, we're going to destroy the whole thing. We're going to destroy the whole human race. So you, you can be motivated simply by a fact of being a human being and wanting to survive if you want in the human rights issue. You can be motivated because you believe in the American Constitution and the principles that are guaranteed there, um, the rights to life and dignity and the pursuit of happiness, and that all are to be treated with equality and they have equal access to justice. That's the principles of our Constitution. That can be the motivator simply because we're American people who believe in the Constitution. Or you can be motivated because you believe in a God who created us and created us all equally and believe in a gospel that, that tells us that we are to treat each other with love and kindness and, and justice rather than uh, in any way with destruction or harmful intents. Whatever the motivation, I think the bottom line is to be motivated to treat others with the dignity and the respect that they deserve it by the fact that they're a human being. One final question, and I'll go back to Mary Lou Reed, but uh, for those who do hate so deeply and uh, they carry out that hate philosophy through their actions. I know many great leaders such as the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. addressed those, but in your experience and your work, what do you think are the main motives or reasons behind those people who find themselves in life filled with such distrust and hate for people that are not like themselves? I mean, my own theory somehow uh, it revolves around uh, people's inability in some cases to cope with the complexities of life that um, they simply find the, the things around them more than they can handle. Uh, maybe it's the fast pace of life, maybe it's the influx of worldwide kind of information, maybe it's the economic situation, maybe it's being forced to encounter more situations more quickly than they're used to or have been able to handle before. But they can't cope with all of that. And so um, as a way of dealing with it rather than dealing with all of these things, they narrow it down. Um, the Aryans, for example, their philosophy is a restrictive philosophy. It's a restrictive vision of world. They can't deal with all the problems of multitude of racial uh, backgrounds, etc. So their solution to it is to build their own little nation, put themselves within that wall, and isolate themselves from everything else and everyone else. They don't like the complexities of American government system, democracy, so eliminate that and make a very, very simple kind of system. I, th I think we find people going into that kind of response to the complexities of life. I think they have other responses too. I think a far radical, um, a radical right or a radical left approach to politics and to society and to life. In either case, uh, it's looking to 
a simplistic solution to complex life. And in looking to that simplistic solution, they somehow make their world manageable. The problem is that they ignore or cut off a good portion of the world and a good portion of life in doing that. Mary Lou Reed. Well, Bill, let's talk a little bit about your personal interaction with the Aryan nations. Uh, I've heard you refer to yourself as the Bombay. <laughs> um, in September of 86, is that the right year? That was when your house, yes. your home, yes. Yes. was bombed. Would you share with our viewers um, what your personal response was to that? What, how, you, how, it, how have you really felt? I was just joking yesterday at a, at a presentation I gave. I wonder how long it's going to take before I'm not introduced as the bombed priest anymore. <laughs> but but um, um, that, that was a traumatic kind of time for me, no question about that. Um, as I reflected upon it that night, when things finally settled down and reflected upon it later, some really important things happened to me as a result of that. It's the first time I, that I had ever been threatened in any way. It's the first time that, that, I've, that anybody um, hated me enough to come threatening my life uh, or physically to hurt me. Um, that's a new experience for me. Um, and one that, that a lot of people go through life and experience frequently, but I've just been shielded from that. I've been protected from that. I've never, I'm sure people will dislike me and probably some people even hate me, uh, but they've never come after me before. I, I just have not lived in that violent kind of world. Um, I've just been protected from that. So that whole experience of knowing that. Um, knowing that if you really stood up for what you believed in, uh, that that might cause some antagonism from some others. Um, the support of the community was so strong around that time that I never really had any second thoughts about backing down from that stand. Um, that never really entered my mind uh, because of the support of the community rallying around the task force and rallying around me. Maybe one of the things, though, that was the, the most impacting for me that I was, I was kind of dealing with around that time anyway, and this, this just sort of uh, um, um, made me reflect upon more deeply, was, was that um, None of us, myself included, none of us really have control over all the events of our life. And that things happen to us um, that we then respond to. And we can either respond in life-giving ways or we can respond in destructive ways. And then our response leads to something else. But we can't necessarily control what that leads to either. Um, I back up a little bit and show how this all happened. I never asked to be chairperson of the task force. But when some people came and said, well, why don't you do this, I said, sure. Um, it seems like something that's important to do, something I believe in doing. And then as things progress, you know, I never asked for those next stages of things. Um, I never asked to have my house bombed. Um, you know, if, I, if I'd have been consulted about that ahead of time, I'd probably suggested that there are better ways of doing this. Um, but they didn't, they didn't ask me that. But yet those situations are there, and they continue to happen. Uh, the, the, resu the good results of what took place in our community, in our whole state, um, deep probably in the five northwestern states, perhaps a little bit across the country because of that bombing of my house, that many people were challenged to look again at their own, s their own prejudices and their own um, um, uh, hidden uh, discrimination in their own hearts and to make a stand and to, to make a positive move for the respect respecting people's rights because they saw what, what, um, what uh, disrespecting people's rights, what that could lead to and what the conclusions might be. So lots of good things happened there, and I guess what I'm leading to is, for me, it, it, it got me to a point of letting go a little bit of the outcome of things and just being responsible for what we do right here, right now. Letting God and letting some other uh, factors in society keep, take care of some of those outcomes of, of the way things go. Well, we were talking about turning points earlier, and you're making a, a, apparently a turning point to some degree in your own life. Mm -hmm. Now, the question what it was a turning point, as you just pointed out, in the whole uh, Aryan nation situation. From then on, I believe the law enforcement people were able to get a handle on it. Right. And uh, uh, at this point, how would you characterize the status of the Aryan nations in our community? Well, I think that, um, uh, that their presence is a weaker presence than what it was before. Uh, I, I think that the Aryans, Aryan nations around the country are in a bit of disarray. Uh, quite a bit of disarray. Um, law enforcement has definitely um, controlled them. New laws and legislation, part of which you've been uh, influential in, in obtaining in our state, has, um, has put some restrictions on behavior that, was be that is destructive. But again, the bombing of your house was that, very much a catalytic that, that's point, right. that's and right. one that pr was perhaps almost necessary to have happen even though you would like to have not had it yeah, happen. Yeah. That there would have been say. other ways. There would have been other ways, maybe. But yes, you're very right. That event and some other events, too, that took place that, 
that we're a part of that energizing of people. One of the things I'm really, really proud of at this community, and I say it in other places whenever I speak, is that um, the, the people of Kootenai County of this area turned what could have been destructive energy into positive energy. What could have been anger, uh, what, what was anger at the Aryans, especially after the bombings in Coeur d'Alene and the bombings in my house, anger and frustration at their presence and what they were doing, instead of ventilating that in destructive ways, you know, going out and wiping them out, as some people voiced once in a while, or pushing them out of the community, or denying their rights and denying their freedom. Uh, instead of doing that or just letting that anger fester inside of them, the people of this community went in positive directions and said, let's do something to, to, to enhance the dignity and the respect that we show to people of, of all colors and all races and all creeds. And that's what energized to get more law enforcement, what energized the, the, the legal outcome, which energized the, the legislation, what, what, what energized the community response. So that you know, the community is just now in a position of where um, uh, they're anxious to protect people's freedom and protect people's rights. They're very tuned into that. And I think part of that showed in that survey that we released a couple of weeks ago that around the state, North Idaho people are a bit warmer toward minority people than in some of the other parts of the state. Not that we can pat ourselves on the back and say, yay, we got the job done. We don't. We still got a long ways to go there. Uh, but I think they have made some moves in that direction, and I think that survey showed it. But putting that energy in positive directions rather than let it be destructive. Um, that's the exciting thing to me about Coeur d'Alene and that I've really grown from and benefited from in these nine years is that, um, you know, you, you gave a long list there of some of the things that I've done over the years, but the, um, I've received a lot of energy from this community too. Um, a lot of those things that you list there, I didn't do before, and I don't consider that I did them by myself. I did them because a lot of energy was in this community. Um, St. Pius Parish is um, the people of that parish are one of the, um, uh, the most important factors in that because there are people that have a lot of faith and have a lot of energy and are, are willing to put that energy into um, into positive directions. They don't just sit there amongst themselves and kind of brood about the little details of how a parish should go, you know. They're, they're willing to take what they believe to be the gospel and to, to implement that in their lives and in their community. And I just see that kind of energy throughout this community. Um, if there's things that need to be done, you can find a group of people in Coeur d'Alene that'll go after it, whether that's hospice or whether that's uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters or whatever it is, you can find a group of people that will put their, put their energy and put their resources behind it and make some good things happen. Well, you're certainly playing a strong leadership role in that, and I think you should take credit. I think we, we, we mix well. We mixed well. I think that setting this example uh, of being able to deal with the irrational, and may, Tony, maybe you want to talk about the courage, the, his nomination for uh, the Courage Award, because I think your ability to uh, lead forth in the face of irrationality well, has been a real asset and a real a measure of courage. We're taping this program at the very beginning of, of May, and that's going to be decided in May, so when this airs, it might have been announced, but <clears throat> Father Bill has been nominated uh, by the uh, national organization that's called the Courage Foundation, and they are housed at the University of Syracuse in the Maxwell School of Public Administration, and I've had the privilege of doing a lot of the correspondence, and I, I should add that he was nominated by the Spokesman Review Chronicle for that but they've contacted a lot of us, and uh, we've had contact with the Courage Foundation. And the Spokesman Review Chronicle nominated him, and, the, and he has made the finalist list by the Foundation itself because he has demonstrated as a leader courage. And they indicated to me that uh, they looked up on courage that uh, required you to stand up for your convictions, which could result in the physical harm to you, uh, loss of your job, uh, or not a promotion. And I, and I think that's a good point to make that even though everyone doesn't face physical dangers, uh, because they're not in that given uh, work, that that might happen. There are a lot of people that have to answer that question from time to time, will I stand for my convictions uh, and I'm going to lose my job to do it? Mm -hmm. uh, well, economics gets such in the way that they cannot stand up. And, and I guess I would ask Father Bill to respond to that. Uh, to what extent should people have courage, and in, 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 in some cases if they had more courage, would the world change faster, the kind of ideal world that you've talked about? Mm. Yeah, uh, there's a, I, I, I'm been named a giraffe, and the giraffe uh, old project is to acknowledge people who are willing to stick their necks out, and I, I'm delighted with that. I like the way they worded things, but that's uh, their, their motto on their plaque, and I wish they had it memorized, would answer your question perfectly. But um, 
they try to recognize people who are willing to stick their necks out and use those people as a model to encourage others as well to be willing to uh, to risk some things for the sake of making our community and our world better um, there's always a balance in there you know with it, that balance in our lives between risking and security um, I just don't have a high need for security I guess I'm willing to risk a whole lot and, and I risk that personally as well as as um, just risk it in terms of, of what I want to do with my life but um, I, we have to keep some kind of a balance between security and risk you know uh, some kind of a, of, a, of, a, of a medium ground in there having said that I think for uh, for a lot of us we're too at, we, we too much uh, go after the security um, gee, the, the challenge that's being put, put forth to people right now in terms of, um, of nuclear weaponry for example and those that are earning their their salaries and working in, in factories that produce nuclear weapons or are instruments of war the challenge that they faced um, is is phenomenal to me that, that that's their that's their life that's their livelihood that's what they know how to do and now they're faced with that kind of question of it, if, if we're to build a world of peace, how can I build weapons of war? And the dilemma that they must be in and the courage that it takes for those people to say, no, I'm going to stop doing this and I'm going to do something else and risk my financial security and my job security and all of that sort of thing. Uh, courage is certainly something that we're going to need more and more of, not just in this human rights issue, but we're going to need more and more of it just to keep our world going, I think. Mary Lou Reed. Well, specifically in... hate me, uh, but they've never come after me before human rights movement. Well, you're saying that the survey mm. shows that we've made a lot of progress, but what do you look ahead as the, the areas that have to be addressed in terms of education, et cetera, to make people understand more fully that they have to live together in equal terms? Uh, I think there's a number of things. I, I don't think that the, that the um, uh, watchdogging, if you want, of the extremist groups in our country is over. I, I think we need to continue doing that. It's, on, it's waned here in northern Idaho. Uh, but it's not over in our country by any means. Um, no, not even within the five northwestern states, as Tony and I were just discussing, and you were privy to just a few minutes ago, uh, that that's still present. So to be watchdogging the extremist groups and to keep exposing them when they are around, I, I think that needs to continue to happen. However, in the long term, and what really needs to happen, uh, the bottom line is that we have some change of heart and that we have some change of soul and have some change of spirit amongst the people of our country. Uh, that there still is too much prejudice and there still is too much discrimination just in day-by-day -day living, uh, just in day-by-day -day, uh, uh, intercourse with people, that there's just still too much uh, prejudice and discrimination and racism. Solutions to that, um, public awareness, um, both for old as well as young. Um, I think one thing that I've learned from, from these couple of years involved with this is that apathy may nev never be tolerated in the, in the face of civil rights and human rights because when, when, when apathy is there, then somehow prejudice and racism and discrimination raises its head again. I'm so we, we may not have any apathy amongst us. Fighting apathy, educating the young. I'm so happy, sorry to interrupt, but uh, we want to thank you, Father Bill, for being okay. here. Senator Reed and I join our staff in congratulating you and thanking you for all the wonderful work you've done. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been paying tribute to Father Bill Wasmuth, who has so recently chaired the Northwest Coalition Against Malicious Harassment and the Kootenai County Task Force on Human Relations. We wish him well in all his endeavors. We would like to invite you to be with us again next week at this same time. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at the same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by an NIC student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.